Near 2100, if we don't change course on climate, absolutely everything you know about modern life will be changed. That's not just about storms and sea level rise, it's also about our politics, our relationship to capitalism and technology, and the whole way we see ourselves going about life in this world. But at four degrees of warming, where we'll be by the end of the century, we would have a global GDP at least 20%, possibly 30% smaller than it would be otherwise. That's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression and permanent. We would have the total loss of all the planet's ice sheets, which over centuries would produce 80 meters of sea level rise. We would have $600 trillion in global climate damages, twice as much wealth as exists in the world today. We'd have hundreds of millions of climate refugees, twice as much war, and half as much food. And those of us still alive on the planet would be struggling with the implications of that in our lives as well, even those of us living in relatively comfortable places, relatively untouched by climate change. That's how profound, universal, and all-encompassing this challenge really is. The human body has a limit for how much heat and humidity it can tolerate. At certain temperatures, as is the case when things get too cold, it can be too hot out for humans to even survive. And already today, in the year 2019, there are parts of the planet, especially in South Asia and the Middle East, where we're approaching that limit every year. In a few decades, it will become more regular, and by the end of the century, there will be whole parts of the planet where you won't be able to walk around outside during summer without risking heat stroke or possibly death. Today, these are some cities that are home to 10, 12, or 15 million people. And in just a few decades, they may, pra may be, practically speaking, uninhabitable. For every degree Celsius of warming, scientists estimate that grain yields will drop by between 10 and 15 percent, which means if we end up at four degrees of warming at the end of the century, which is where we're headed if we don't change course, we could have food that is only half as bountiful as it is today, the same amount of land producing only half as much food. In addition to that, we will be dealing with droughts, we'll be dealing with flooding, so the impacts will be even more dramatic. And on top of all that, the extra carbon in the atmosphere is already making the food we grow today less nutritious. All of the vitamins that are in the food we eat are falling as carbon concentrations get higher. So at the end of the century, if we don't change course, we'll have considerably less food. Its production will be much less reliable because of extreme weather events like droughts and flooding. And the food that we do get will be much less nutritious than the food that we have today. At only about two degrees of warming, or a little north of that, it's expected that all of the planet's ice sheets would have been made inevitably lost. That is, over centuries, um, all of the ice of the Arctic and the Antarctic and all of the glaciers of the world will be melting inevitably. That will produce, all told, as much as 80 meters of sea level rise, enough to flood two-thirds of the world's major cities should we not move them. It will literally drown the, um, the entire coastline of the planet, putting underwater every beach you've ever been to, the White House in DC, the Winter White House in Florida. It will flood huge river systems in Bangladesh. It'll, it'll flood the Basilica in Venice. It'll flood um, other huge monuments that we've taken for granted as permanent features of human ancestry. Already today, fires in the American West have grown dramatically worse over the last century. I recently spoke to the mayor of Los Angeles, who's 48 years old. The year he was uh, born, 60,000 acres burned in California. The year he was elected mayor in 2013, it was 600,000, a tenfold increase. The year he was re-elected mayor in 2017, it was 1.2 million, a doubling in just four years. And the year after, 2018, it was 1.9 million, a 50% increase in just a single year. This is the situation we're in today, and it's expected that in the American West, wildfires will at least double and possibly quadruple by mid-century. After mid-century, scientists don't know how to model what the wildfires will be like because they say so much of the state will have already burned at that point that they don't know the plant life that will grow in its wake and so can't model just how flammable that new plant life is. But just working from mathematical models suggests that at the year 2100, at four degrees of warming, wildfires in California could be 64 times worse than they are today. Which means, again, using just a rudimentary mathematical model, 75% of the state would burn every single year. Already we're dealing with unprecedented storms on the planet. Um, Houston has been hit by five 500-year storms in the last five years.
The Caribbean every season is hit by one hurricane after another. Um, recently, a, a historic typhoon hit Mozambique, the worst storm in 100 years, and was followed just five weeks later by a storm of similar intensity. Um, these storms will get dramatically worse, dramatically more intense over the course of the century. This shouldn't surprise us because the clearest promise of all of the global warming models, of all of the predictions that are made by scientists, is that warming will produce additional precipitation, more intense precipitation. And that isn't just a matter of hurricanes and typhoons. It also means intense flooding far inland in all of the countries of the world, which will make life of all kinds difficult, but especially the life of our farmers who are trying to raise food in the way that we've come to depend on over many centuries. Throughout the world, um, there is a shortage of fresh water, and it may be that collectively we have to decide to stop populating in places that don't naturally have water resources and move to places that do. That could also have a huge impact on a place like California or truly any of the breadbasket regions of the world which are already starved of water um, and struggling to maintain the resources they need to produce especially the food that they grow. One of the scariest and least understood aspects of climate change is the effect on the oceans. The oceans are unbelievably valuable to us today in combating climate change. They absorb about 90% of the excess heat um, that we've produced in the planet, and they also eat up a ton of carbon and produce oxygen. In that way, they are like plants which absorb carbon and produce oxygen through photosynthesis. But because the, planet, the planet's oceans have already been changed, because of this additional warming, they're becoming less and less able to do all of these things. And that means ultimately that the planet could be deprived of some significant amount of food because the entire uh, ecosystem of the ocean depends on the production of oxygen to support fish life and other seafood, which means that for all of those parts of the world that de are dependent on seafood for, um, for their animal proteins, um, they will have to look elsewhere when they're trying to find food to eat. Probably the scariest risk to the ocean system is to what's called the um, cir ocean circulating system. This is like the, the Gulf Stream and other jet streams. It's a way that the ocean regulates the temperature of the planet by moving hot water around so that it cools off and vice versa. This is the central system regulating the planet's weather and it has already been slowed by about 15 percent. If it stopped entirely, we'd be dealing with a completely catastrophic scrambling of the planet's weather systems with um, completely unthinkable snowstorms and almost like new ice ages arriving immediately. Scientists don't believe that that will happen, but incremental damage has a similar, if much smaller, effect. It is why we're already seeing much more extreme weather in places like Europe, which are at the end of the Gulf Stream, and it may be why we're dealing with uh, more El Nino seasons in the Pacific as well. Today, air pollution is already killing 9 million people a year, the equivalent of Holocaust every single year. Now, air pollution is not exactly a result of climate change, but it's produced by the same forces that produce climate change, namely the burning of fossil fuels. And the impacts are not just the lethal ones. These particulates can damage your cognitive performance. They affect low birth weight and premature birth. They affect the development of children in utero and out of utero. They affect rates of schizophrenia and autism and ADHD. They affect respiratory health, coronary health. Nearly every aspect of human health or mental health you could possibly imagine is negatively affected by these small particulates. And they are damaging the life of millions of people around the globe today. They are also, in a perverse way, helping us when it comes to climate change because they reflect sunlight back up into outer space, which means because of this pollution, we now have about a half degree less global warming than we would have without it, which means if we took action to completely clear the skies and save those 9 million lives a year, we would then be adding about a half degree of global warming to our system immediately, which would put us today close to the brink of catastrophe, two degrees of warming that scientists have told us so much to fear, which means we're in a kind of an impossible position when it comes to pollution. Either we continue to um, continue to pollute the air and poison those people breathing it, or we protect the temperature of the planet. The disease systems of the world have been stable for many centuries. Globalization has, has shuffled them a little bit, but climate change promises to shuffle them even more. Today, Malarial, malaria disease and dengue 
are essentially tropical concerns because mosquitoes simply don't travel that far north of the tropics. But in just a few decades time, they can be flying as far north as the Arctic Circle, bringing those same diseases to populations that have never had to encounter them before. And of course, there are many other diseases we don't yet really understand which may spring up under new climate conditions and which the human animal has not yet developed any capacity to deal with. There's also the possibility that diseases could be released from melting ice. Um, today in the Arctic and the subarctic, there are trapped in permafrost diseases as old as centuries or even millennia. Some of them, when that ice melts, become reanimated and can still poison us. Now, that's unusual. Most of them simply die when they melt. But already a few years ago, um, per melting permafrost in Siberia exposed the carcass of a dead reindeer that had died from anthrax. And that anthrax traveled into the air, spread, killed a whole fleet of present day reindeer, and also at least one Russian boy, dead of a disease that had been stored in Arctic ice for a century. Economists believe that Climate change could have totally catastrophic impacts if left unchecked. Some of them thinks those, th think those impacts would be as small as 5 or 10% of global GDP. Others think as high as 30%. Um, much of this is still being sorted out because the economics is changing very, very rapidly. But it shouldn't surprise us when we know of all of the uh, total damages that are li we're likely to see this century if we don't change course. And a recent report suggests that at four degrees, where we'll be by the end of the century, we could have $600 trillion in global damages, which is twice all the wealth that exists in the world today. This is in part because of agricultural productivity, which declines. It's in part because cognitive performance declines when it's hot out. It's unusual or even kind of difficult to process, but there's, economists say, a sort of ideal temperature for economic productivity. It is the historical median temperature of the United States and Germany. Um, but of course, even those places have been warmed so much that we are now in places like those countries suffering about a percentage point loss of GDP per year because of climate impacts. Of course, there are now those places in the world that have been warmed from too cool to be optimally productive to the exact optimal temperature. One of them is Silicon Valley, which is today sitting at 13 degrees Celsius, exactly the optimal temperature for economic productivity. Those studying the relationship between uh, climate change and war say that for every degree of warming, for every half degree of warming, we would get between a 10 and 20 percent increase in conflict. This is not to say that we'll, we'll be able to point at any particular war and say that was the result of climate change or that wasn't the result of climate change, but looking globally over the course of decades, we will see many more conflicts than we would have seen without climate change. And this is not surprising considering that global warming produces famines and droughts. It in, uh, intensifies pressure on unstable governments to provide relief to citizens from extreme heat and other kinds of, of pressures. Um, and in fact, we've already seen some conflicts that have been named by uh, those studying them as essentially climate driven. The Syrian civil war, for instance, which produced millions of, of refugees, uh, was the result in part of a famine produced by a drought that would have not happened without climate change. Now, it doesn't make conflict inevitable. Next door, Lebanon endured the same drought and didn't fall into disarray. But we'll be seeing more states pressurized in more ways going forward, which means by the end of the century, if we don't change course and these estimates are correct, we will see as a globe at least twice as much war as we have today and possibly significantly more than that. And the relationship between temperature and conflict isn't just about the relationship between states. It also happens within states and even happens at the individual level. When it's hotter out, rates of murder go up, rates of rape go up. The thing that most climate scientists worry about more than anything else is not any individual impact, it's the way that these impacts work together and make it harder for us to respond. If you take seriously the proposition that climate scientists put forward, that by the end of the century, parts of the planet could be hit by six climate-driven natural disasters at once, it's very hard to imagine a government or a society that re could respond to those kinds of impacts and still provide relief to all of its citizens. Instead, it's a lot easier to imagine a society falling into disarray, pummeled in that way by those climate impacts. And that will happen much sooner than the year 2100. In fact, it's already happening today. The California wildfires of the last few years were devastating in their own right, destroyed whole communities, killed dozens of people. But they also meant that whole landscapes in California were totally denuded of trees, which means when the rains came, then there were mudslides. And those mudslides were crippling, devastating too. In Santa Barbara a few years ago, dozens were killed by, um, by mudslides. And there are those kinds of accelerating impacts 
everywhere you look when it comes to climate. It's not just a matter of discrete impacts here and there, which we have to respond to. It's a matter of the entire system turning against us. In fact, sort of going to war with us and depriving us of the capacity to respond in anything like the humane way that you or I would like to see us respond.